Third Eye Drops are intended for open-minded adults. Now, now administering third, third, third Eye Drops. Cosmic gratitude for, once again, curating your consciousness with our particular ontological pheromone. I'm sticking with that. I like it. It makes just enough sense, but not too much. If things make too much sense, you're definitely going down the wrong path. But for those of you who are poking their non-local head through our digital threshold for the first time, which I feel like could be a good number of you, considering we have the infinitely lovely and talented Amanda Sage on this episode. Welcome, and I am humbled to wiggle waveforms into you, my dear sentient sack of stardust. My patchily bearded visage is not worthy of you. Uh, There are so many fantastic angles to this mind meld with Amanda. I have sat and marveled at a number of them, actually. But something I keep coming back to is the paradoxical nature of our interconnected separateness. Uh, Here we are as distinct beings with unique inner worlds, appearances, preoccupations, genetics, and free will, yet we are comprised of the very same molecules, the very same carbon and oxygen and nitrogen. I think that's mostly what we're made up of. And that doesn't even broach the more esoteric samadhi type interconnectedness we can plug our brains into if they are tuned properly. Yet from that soupy atomic Gnostic network, uh, we get this persistent distinctness. Uh, And as that blossoms, Wow, do we become self-important. Our egos swell, our problems seem gargantuan, so much so that we start to deify that separateness, hoard it, protect it, elevate it, all the while forgetting that we are but a fleeting flicker of a thought in a dendrite of the almighty tapestry of intelligence that we emerged from and will one day disappear back into That's one of my biggest fears, falling victim to just that, wasting my time, completely absorbed in my separateness, because I know that is the single most vicious form of self-inflicted limitation we can cast upon ourselves, yet we still do it. We waste an inordinate amount of time ruminating about all of the microaggressions the universe levies upon us. I should say perceived microaggressions. Do you ever catch yourself complaining about some inconsequential course of events over and over again? Like somebody brings you a sandwich with the wrong cheese on it, and then everybody you talk to for the rest of the day, you have to be like, yeah. And then they they fucking brought me Gouda on my sandwich when I specifically asked for pepper jack hopefully you're not quite that angry about it but you know what i'm saying right it's such a vicious cycle of self-important nonsense and it is a direct obstacle to being a better version of yourself uh but please don't take it from me i hear it time and time again from great artists and successful people that come on this show they talk as if They're the exact opposite of that, a conduit, that they do their best work when their ego is only functioning enough to be a conscious midwife for birthing whatever their particular brand of novelty is into existence. And of course, Amanda and I do hurl our proverbial pickaxes of inquiry at all of those novelty nuggets that I just ranted about, but I had to share that little curiosity appetizer with you because that interconnected separateness paradox has really been lubing my wonder whiskers 
over the past few days, and I had to get that out. Anyway, what is there to say about the mystifyingly wonderful and talented Amanda Sage that isn't inherently obvious? I'm not sure, so I'll just say it again. Regardless, she is really one of the premier visionary artists on planet Earth, and she has a mind to match. I truly enjoyed getting to know her and exploring the human condition with her for 90 or so minutes. Uh, Absolutely go and crawl the gorgeous psychedelic tapestry that is her art at amandasage.com. And she's also always traveling and doing events as well. So do look into that if you want to connect with her and create with her. Okay, Okay, future future gods. gods. We shall commence this mind meld with Amanda Sage post haste. But before we do, please consider supporting Third Eye Drops, the primary way that you can do an altruistic energy blast in our direction is to become a patron at patreon.com forward slash third eye drops. What is Patreon? Well, at Patreon. You can crowdfund the show and get rewards in the process, and depending upon how much you pledge, uh, you can do things like influence the show, join a Google Hangout with myself and guests you've heard on the show, and you can also get exclusive Third Eye Drops merchandise or art, depending upon how much you pledge. Uh, So again, head to patreon.com forward slash third eye drops to get in on that. You can also execute the necessary keyboard incantations to arrive at our website, thirdeyedrops.com, uh, where you will find all of our mind melds, musings, and ways to support us. For all that have shot us a donation or done their Amazon shopping through our Amazon portal or bought a shirt from the Third Eye Drops store, whatever, I stretch my quantum gratitude whiskers to caress you, friend. I also want to thank everyone that has taken a few seconds to type Third Eye Drops into iTunes and clicked five stars and subscribe. Speaking of which, we are oh so close to 100 reviews on iTunes, so Make that arbitrary yet sweet goal come to pass, pals. All you have to do is look us up, Third Eye Drops, on iTunes. Click five stars, you lovely, lovely beast, you. Speaking of lovely beasts, psychic smooches to our friends at TimeWheel.net and MindPod Network for nurturing these mind melds and doing all the wondrous things that they do. Begin symbiosis. Amanda Sage. Hello, hello. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you doing? I'm fantastic. I just got a, a nice cold shower in. It's one of my, my pre-podcast rituals. Just gets me all frisky and, and ready to be uh, hopefully hyper verbose and, and summon novelty through the portal of my mouth hole. Awesome. And, and I have my awesome. favorite socks on, so... Um, But so anyway, we were just talking about before we were rolling, um, our mutual friend, Andrew O'Keefe and you uh, took one of your paintings out during the Occupy LA demonstrations a few years back. And I remember when, uh, you know, we were riffing about possible uh, topics to jump off of. One of the things that is always a mark of somebody who has ascended to a really comfortable level in their craft is a certain level of playfulness. And a mm-hmm. certain level level of they don't need to take themselves so seriously anymore because it's it's clear. I mean, I'm not saying this is necessarily your mindset, but like the skill in and of itself is clear. And then like the universe starts to play through that skill. And the way I'm connecting these dots in my mind is the particular painting that you guys decided to bring out to these demonstrations. Um can you can you explain what what that painting is depicting well there's a lot there (laughs) like i could talk for like an hour about all the things you just brought up um 
Well, that painting in particular is the Anasuramai, which you're talking about. It's the, it, which means the act of lifting the skirt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it is probably one of my most um, well-known paintings in a lot of ways because of, I think, many things. One of them is just like the extremity of the, of the message itself and the action, which is very shocking and kind of like, takes you aback and it, it is a protest mm -hmm. so that painting is out of all of my paintings probably the most extreme like most direct protest um we it was it was um i mean it's a so the gesture itself is is known to be the most powerful gesture to stop an army in its tracks or um scare away the devil and and this is something that goes back really far in a variety of cultures. The gesture historic. of lifting the skirt. Yeah. Okay. And there, I got, I learned about this through a book called The Story of V, written by Catherine Blackledge. And um, she, it's a, a fascinating book. Totally um, recommend every, everyone to read it. Um, because it's the story of the vagina. And it's, also, it's something, a lot of stories and things that you never learned about. We never, you know, it was, it's one of the organs in the human body that has been the least uh, researched and studied and also is the most like, I mean, it has its own brain mm. in many ways, right? Um, and, and there's a lot of research that, or a lot of things that she found. It's a book that was based on her th thesis work. And uh, so I learned about the Anasuramai in this book and read all these different stories through many different cultures, Persia, Greece, Africa, like, all over the world where people where there are ancient kind of like stories of women and men also doing this. And it's a shock experience that happens when, when the, when you're confronted with this and it's a, sh it's a shock that gives you a few moments of kind of like actually laughter mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. a way too. Like laughter is one of the first responses and that then clears the slate of wherever you were, whatever you were thinking to allow life to spring forth again. So there's a lot of reasons why that painting is like, yeah, powerful, you know, and why we would also take it to a demonstration. And we took the actual original. We took it on yeah, a walk. Yeah. And around the city block of, of, well, around City Hall in downtown Los Angeles and kind of like a ceremonial <laughs> journey. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's such an awesome, like, Probably, I'm, I'm guessing it was kind of a spur of the moment idea. I also noticed on your on your website when I was just scrolling through some of your work that that particular piece looked like it was painted over quite a long time. Was mm -hmm. it like multiple years? Yeah, it was like five years wow. or so uh, that I I uh, from when I started it to when I said that it was complete, mm -hmm. and it had to go through a big process. And this is part of one of your first kind of questions of kind of like the being able to paint something well and then also this kind of humor or like going beyond the 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 technique the you know the mm -hmm, mm -hmm. whatever you're trying to portray into kind of a losing yourself and therefore finding new form you know there's like a there's a relaxing um stage to that evolution right that you go through and being able to laugh at yourself I think that was kind of how you put it or being able to look back at yourself in a different way and there um and I think with this this piece was a big um step for me hmm. in that for sure because it was it's also a self-portrait oh yeah yeah <laughs> it was a pretty like yeah, that's, major that's like hilarious. this is what took me years of like oh man can i do this so this mm -hmm. is kind of like intense you know like i don't do i want to present myself that directly and I, the thing is is that i knew that i couldn't use another model it wasn't something that um I, I feel like I could put somebody in somebody else, somebody else in those shoes because it needed, it would be more direct if it was me. And this is, and so it became like, well, what would I actually lift my skirt to? Like I recognized that the gesture was so powerful, but then, and I just even started painting it life size. I was like, well, of course it has to be life size. And that's, <laughs> but the, the whole developing of um, the refinement of the composition of the story of what I was really lifting my skirt to, I had to go through some evolving in that period too. And this is what happens to a lot of paintings. 
I mean, there are so many paintings that are sitting in my archives in various places that I've started at different times over the last 20 years that have never been finished because the certain things haven't solved themselves yet, you know? And so that painting, I, I mean, it really works if you, you got to make a deadline with some things and you revisit also, you mm -hmm. grow with them. And um, every painting is like that. Some paintings come out, you know, in like three hours and boom, don't touch it again. That was like powerful channeling, like so li live performance paintings like are, are like that sometimes. Mm -hmm. I feel like those are, you know, and a painting like that, I mean, that was a really designed piece that went through an evolution of, of, of a storyline before it could be finished. And then I exit. And then it was the question, where am I going to exhibit this piece? At that point, I'd never done a painting in that scale kind of like, you know, and my mom was like, who's going to buy a painting like that and put that <laughs> in the living room? I'm like, mom, this isn't a living room painting. This is a museum hey. piece. I put it in my living. I, actually, I shouldn't. I probably shouldn't say that. I've been talking to you for like five minutes, and I just told you that I would <laughs> hang hang a naked picture of you in my living room. So that that's not awkward at all. But anyway, no. The, I have no I have no awkwardness around that painting at all anymore. And it is this painting has probably been seen more than any other painting of mine. I, I believe it. It it is it is an iconic image. It really is. And and I completely understand what you're saying about how much more difficult it is to produce a piece in a live kind of flow state setting where there might not be an ultimate goal or you're just doing it for the sake of doing it versus mm. almost like a concept themed thing like the only thing I, I really have to compare it to is music but I was always the type of person that would want to write like a concept record right like I'd want to say mm. some kind of big kind of masturbatory gesture about something grandiose and then i'd have other bandmates who are like let's just write cool songs and then so, so it's kind of like painting with five other people with their own agendas but but yeah those those types of songs or paintings i would imagine are much more difficult to execute because you you can't fake the inspiration you have to actually be chasing after what really feels like the muse or saying something authentic versus just doing it for the sake of doing it. So I can imagine that that would be a lot more time consuming. I mean, there's so many things involved in that piece. Like when I was painting the table that she is lifting her skirt to, mm -hmm. uh, and the people around that table, when it came down, that was one of the last things that I painted. It was kind of like, okay, so now here I'm about to paint these people. I've, who are they? Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, I'm not just making some pretty composition that's going to be, you know, this and that. Uh, this is a pretty intense um, thing to be put up to. It's like, so uh, if I paint these faces, then I'm making a statement about <laughs> who is sitting around that table. You know, it's, a, it, it's powerful, it's like magic. And then I, I had this hit, really, that it wasn't um, – I wasn't to paint any actual faces. Yeah. That's why I painted just profiles in them because they're, this is a story that I don't, I am not assuming is true in a way. It's a symbolic, in a symbolic thing. You know, it's a. It's like an archetype. It's rather than archetype. like like a voodoo attack against certain individuals, right? <laughs> but that's what art can do. Right. No, know? I, yeah, that that's a really interesting idea. The idea that you can non-locally hit people with negative energy or maybe positive energy too. Have you ever, well, do you, do you consider that when you're making art? A hundred percent. I mean, the more I realize, like over the years of doing this, of how powerful the image is, the more terrifying it is to pick up the brush. Cause mm -hmm, you're like, mm -hmm. dude, what I could do right now. And then you're like, Oh man, <laughs> it's a, it's, it, it's an interesting battlefield that is um, really, really expansive and exciting. But that's the challenge. I mean, when you want to talk about challenges, it's probably one of the things that challenges me the most is exactly that subject of like, oh, my God. So I could, you know, really, really. OK, so eviscerate somebody. You could just. What is it? I mean, but that's not my role. Like, if you know much about me or my work or what I, I like, I think of you like I'm not a big critic. I'm not really interested in being a super big critic. It's not something that I enjoy. Like even I put out posts or certain things like in social media, 
and it's too opinionated and I get, I, I don't like to get into the, into I, the discussion and the battlefield. It's not at all my. I 100% <laughs> agree. And I, I have to demonstrate and, and reach into my restraint sometimes because I'm sure you've been there where you're like mid typing and you're like, no. I'm not, I'm not doing this because I mean, especially with the climate right now, it's so easy to get sucked into arguments or go down negative rabbit holes or start getting an exactly. ad, ad hominem nonsense against people that you don't agree with. But I completely agree. You got to pick your battles and choose where you're going to spend your energy because you only have so much of it. Like today um, in the group that I've created for my show, actually, there was a conversation that came up because I was I was playfully poking fun at some kind of popular trappings of conspiracy theories that I personally find to be a little bit ridiculous and mm. um other people bringing up the point well wouldn't don't you think that you're probably amongst the same group of fringe people that you're poking fun at and and I I didn't take offense to it but I couldn't let it lay because I personally think that we we do still need to exercise logic and restraint and not go down a million rabbit holes of what ifs and and value everybody's subjective ideas equally because that can really be I mean if if you're on the outside looking in and you're you're looking for answers and you're looking for something ontologically meaty to bite into and the first thing you come up against is some flat earth like stuff which i i don't know your opinions amanda but i'm gonna go out on a limb and say that i don't believe the earth is flat and you know it's that that would really turn me off if i if i went to some website for the first time and i'm looking for answers i'd be like yeah no this this whole subculture is not for me i'm gonna turn fox news back on so you, you might really be turning away some people who are looking for some meaningful shit by by talking about you know the the wrong quote unquote fringe subject. I, fully, I think that's a problem. I think it is a problem too. <laughs> I mean obviously I, it must be around it all the time in festival culture and where where cuz cuz that like as much as I love it there's also elements of it where it's so welcoming and tolerant of everything that it's hard to like know what to do with certain elements of it. Yeah. I, I I think it does just like with any kind of um, I guess like scene or or interest group, it tends to get like uh, you know stuck together. It doesn't yes. like it, and it does it, and it's like okay, we're sustain, sustaining ourselves, and okay, the world, you know, you see the world through these glasses. But I'm really interested in there being more bridge. Um, building into all sectors because I, I mean uh, my work at least like in the bigger vision of what I what I feel like I'm speaking to is a deeper resonant kind of like um, spark of the human spirit and it doesn't matter what you look like it doesn't matter what you do you know like our creativity is like a spark of, of inspiration and that's and it goes beyond a scene, a specific scene or a specific lifestyle or anything like that. Like that's ultimately what I would like to connect with, you know? Yeah. And, and being that we are in this, this era of echo chambers and confirmation bias and being able to just look up, you know, whatever quote unquote facts you want to corroborate whatever your worldview is, um, how do we how do we do that? Because it seems like we're, yeah. you know, we're in this whole double edged sword situation where, yes, we can we can get together in unprecedented ways and and, and execute incredible, uh, you know, works of of art or creativity or togetherness or symbiosis that were never possible in the past. But it seems like the tug of war in that direction is losing, right? Like it's, it seems like this echo chamber, at least recently in the last several months has been really, really difficult to, to break mm. out of. And like, really, I don't know, like to me, this, this whole election cycle without getting political has, has been really discouraging for that, for like an energetic yeah. reason, just, just like, ah, I thought we were going this way and here we are like being 
pulled back into the pit of, you know, bifurcation between myself and the other. Yeah, it's the it's the contrast between the oh, it should be this way, but it feels like this, like the the resistance, like the feeling of like this unclarity. Where is the truth? Who's speaking the truth? Can't we just get together, guys, and like make this easier rather than more complex? I mean, I feel like that's a lot of like how I feel oh, yeah. in relationship, you know, to it. And I think those are the growing pains, though, of becoming more aware. So there's like the, these like flows that happen also in culture and society and space time. And maybe it's magnetic fields. Maybe it's something to do with like, okay, you bring up flat earth. Dude, I don't know. Right. I, 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 I am, I am to, to, in terms of like belief, I, I really feel like there's a lot possible. Like I really don't want to want to limit it, but I feel like that it's so um, it's so hard, like to. to right. No, I, I keep and, going like, wait, okay, I can touch this and I can do this, like all the other stuff. Like I love to listen to people talk about it. I read stuff, you know, in terms of like podcasts or radio mm-hmm. shows or things that like theories that are really out there. I love it. But do I believe any of it? I don't know. It just feeds more imagery into what's the potential. I mean, that there are multiple realities happening right now. Yeah, I buy that in some way. Like, how is this working? I don't know. Right, right. You know, I actually just, have you seen the video or any of the videos of this little kid? He's like 12, 13, like super handsome little devil, blonde hair. And he, the first video of him that went viral was him talking at some conference because he invented like a free energy device and um (laughs) now now recently another video of him is going viral where he's talking about uh the mandela effect and the idea that if you did something if you essentially altered one electron in our dimension we may instantaneously pop into the next like collapse our own like the quantum potential the the wave form of our own dimension and pop over into the adjacent dimension and and that's why you have things like the quote unquote mandela effect like where yeah. you remember it as it, like the example yeah. he used is mirror mirror on the wall versus magic mirror on the wall or um the yeah. name Mandela effect for people that don't know is some people swear that Nelson Mandela died in some event, but he didn't. And, you know, obviously all these things are just very subjective and could easily be explained by some misreporting or misunderstanding. But, you know, there's enough there that you kind of sit there and wonder like, well, maybe there, maybe some people were, maybe some people's consciousness were entangled with a different dimension and now they popped over into another dimension. And that's why shit doesn't make sense anymore. And that's why Donald no, the Trump fact does that, it. <laughs> the fact that this kid is going viral, right? I would love to actually, I want to look that up like afterwards. Yeah, I'll send research it to you. Stuff, yeah. But I mean, I have seen something of that come, come through recently. But, um, you know, like how many people are receptive to that? And it's like, what is the messenger that is going to make them receptive, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. like a nine year old kid going up <laughs> that people are going to be able to be like, yeah. Oh, uh, Hey dude, did you see this and share it with and share it and share it? You know, um, what's the messenger look like for the expanding awareness, you know, on a big scale. I mean, I think the flat earth theory is something that immediately gets people like, fuck you crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the immediate response, you know, I mean, things that I have heard in context with the flat earth are like, yeah, okay. There's interesting that it like opens a can of worms basically. Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. like, okay, we were being lied to on like pretty much every level, which is really, or a lot of like really fundamental levels. And that's like a, that's a, that's a really challenging thing to even consider, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's one of those kinds of, of arguments that, that where, you know, you, you kind of draw I always every now and then I'll go back and read the actual terms for for poor arguing techniques and I can't remember the exact name of this one but it's like you essentially say something that's true 
and then you draw a false conclusion from something else you've determined to be true and you use some other fact as a means to arrive at a conclusion that's not you know that that's not due to that fact like you're being lied to by this this and this therefore the earth is flat like it's like hold on a second like we gotta exactly. get past <laughs> so many other steps for you to prove to me that the earth is flat but but that works for people and people use that like kind of I don't know if it's sophistry intentionally or or deception intentionally or if it's like you know the like this whole shit posting fad if you've heard of that where people post stuff they don't really believe just to get a rise out of people it's mm -hmm. it's so weird there's so many different motivations and you know the the whole like pepe the frog chaos thing is just so you never you never know why people are doing what they're doing and i just you know like and the flat earth thing like my here's my conclusion to the whole thing we're probably a handful of years at most away from individual people that you know being able to go into the stratosphere or into orbit or have drones that will be you know pretty widely available that can fly up and see the curvature of the earth like is i, I feel like somehow the, i feel like somehow the conversation still even won't end then I feel like some people will just hold on and they'll be like, "No, it, it's no, it's it's because they want to camera you. images. It's it goes above fifteen thousand feet, and then the the camera is somehow altered or something. Like, there's always going to be something, you know? Because you haven't seen it yourself, but then you, the, but then still, there's a barrier between you and the uh, uh. right. right. <laughs> yeah, it's, see, and and this is why this is why to an extent, I just I feel like. Get, getting back to that point we just have to be careful how we spend our energy like how like what sort of bearing does this have on your subjective reality making the world a better place doing constructive things if, if any you know and i i just don't think it does and i think on on the note of everything that we were talking about previous to this tangent though we started getting down the road mm. of you know the role of creativity and bringing people together and how eventually yeah that could be the case. And although I've been sort of belly aching about all of this echo chamber stuff and choose your own reality, choose your own reality tunnel scenario that we seem to be in right now, I really do think we are just one technology or one way of expressing creativity away from shattering all of that and really <laughs> bringing people together in an unprecedented way. Because and and I don't want to like regurgitate too much of things I've said at other shows because this is something I I ramble about a lot. But I'll I'd rather let you kind of riff on it and see what you think that could look like because I'm sure you have some some ideas there. Well, around creativity and that being this kind of key to a real next evolution. Mm -hmm. In, in the experience, the, the human experience. Yeah. I think, yeah. is that, that a way to kind of condense yeah, that in? That and also how you think it could be conveyed in terms of like maybe a way we don't have yet or a way that is starting to emerge. I've got some ideas well, that might kick off a yeah. thought process. Well, you... immediately starting to emerge or stuff like VR experience stuff. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. is something that is totally in our midst yeah it's going to continue to be developed i mean the stuff that i'm sure andrew android jones and his pals are working on are like cutting edge mm -hmm, mm -hmm. along with a bunch of them out there i mean that's something that is going to transform for sure uh sensory experience multi-level like creator <laughs> potential i mean there's stuff that's happening already in that field that every time i hear like the latest and i didn't go to the big there's a big um vr like conference congress whatever that they had here in la like a couple weeks ago and i really wish i had gone but um yeah that's the field you know that's really gonna give people also this experience of like tilt brush and all these different things that are um, I don't know what all of them are called, but being able to like take something 2D, mold it into 3D, walk around it. I mean, the way what it's going to do to changing product design and 
fashion design and all kinds of things, I mean, is, is massive. Also like the, I've been thinking a lot lately about how people are really their own, um, you know, they're able to create their own things easily now, um, through all the companies online you, know, you just upload an image and you can have it printed on anything. Yeah. And you're also your own storyteller. You know, you can turn yourself into, you know, you can create, you create your own TV show on YouTube. You do, you know, your own, your own producer, um, more than ever. And with an, a potential for audience, that's massive. So, and I think that's, um, I mean, it's interesting when you think about the artist and the creator, the producer in context without also commerce, where you're you're doing it also as a way as as a means to make money. And I think a lot of people that I come across have that subliminal thing in their minds too, like, well, I'm not an artist because I don't sell my art. You know? Mm. What about the artist that is like that everybody is an artist and has a creative outlet and I see the world through a creative perspective, right? That's like a, that's a big difference and shift and there's vocabulary, there's a revisiting of vocabulary. Like, well, how can I actually say that I am an artist? I mean, I, I teach a lot and I have people that come to my workshops and often they'll be like, I'm not an artist, but, but. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to do exactly what I said I wouldn't do in terms of skipping a bunch of steps and arriving at a conclusion. But I'm, I'm just going to say some. I don't know if I've ever said this on the on the show before or like in front of anybody that wasn't just a close friend that wouldn't think I'm a crazy person. But I think it's quite possible that the quality that we think of as creativity, when you reduce it down to its most basic emanation, is a fundamental property, like a fundamental law of reality similar to like a gravity or a um you know like just laws of, it's tricky though because laws of physics don't necessarily exist they're things that can be measured by the way things behave but most people you know would think that there is a a in the cosmology and the makeup of the universe gravity is like a measurable phenomenon mm -hmm. and i mm -hmm. think creativity has to almost be that sort of a a quality it, at least in terms of sentient beings maybe maybe it's not like something i don't know though i because and and this is almost like a conversation about consciousness at large too like if you've ever yeah. gotten into any of the the panpsychist ideas of like david chalmers where he argues that you know maybe we need to start thinking about consciousness as a as a quality of um, exactly what I'm talking about, like something that is just an inherent law. It's an inherent, there's an inherent amount of it in everything. And yeah. we need to start thinking of it that way versus this thing is conscious and this thing isn't. Because that totally. that's, you know, the more we learn about, even scientifically, um, about objects, I mean, everything seems to display a certain level of sentience, like plants for sure. Um, you know, probably all the way down to rocks and you mm -hmm. know, things that we don't think of as alive at all, but are in fact made up of living things. So I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of different directions to go with this. No, but I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you of, spit on it for a bit. That's a lot of fun. Um, just to be like creativity as in, in comparison with like gravity and consciousness, you know, as a, as a, a bubble that we can fill with how that actually works. Like here, okay, here's gravity and how it works. How does creativity work, you know, and compare that. I think that's really fascinating and powerful. It makes it become like a really powerful, um, even more powerful, uh, subject or law, you know, and I do, I do believe it's a law in a lot of ways. I agree with you. I think that's like a, a stretch. I haven't thought of it in that context, but it's something that you um, can use, you know, you, you have command of, you can levitate <laughs> in creativity. You know, what is that as uh, compared to being, you know, I don't know, that's fun, fun idea. But the, um, I think in any given situation, you can, can call on creativity and it also has a lot to do with opening um, yourself to something beyond your own um, 
your own knowing. It's like a knowing that opens its pores into like mm. potential that, and that's how I feel a lot through like what painting has taught me, which then has also taught me about living in a different way as well. You know, and I become like opening a sense and, and studying that sense and the capacity of it to a point where you lose yourself. You can lose yourself in it because you trust it so much is something where you then open up into another field of like, that's in the soup, like the veils, like, you know, it really, really comes uh, together. You know, it comes together and brings like a, a factor that is something otherworldly, something that, okay, how do you measure that? Um, it defies the laws maybe in a certain way, but that is the essence of creativity in a certain mm -hmm. ways. Like true creativity is something that is magical, I think, that we see and we say it comes from, where is that coming from, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. Defies the laws. What do you mean by that? Defies the laws of what we see and f of what we already know to be mm. true in the sense of something we've already seen. Like I would guess like in, create, in the creative sector, right? It's like, okay, you is something truly creative. It, something that's reproduced is not necessarily creative, right? True, Would true. That be so you or have at to least be a creative. lower, more primitive level, you know, like a, like a copy or a... Well, it a, could be a remix that yeah, is incredibly yeah, yeah. creative, sure, right? Sure. It can, there's, everything is a remix, basically. Yes, yes. We are living in, in the remix times, for sure. And it's a constant remix. And so a truly creative act is a new way of putting things together, right? Yeah, yeah. And at, at this point, I mean, it's almost tempting to say that we've we've surpassed originality but I, I don't i don't think we have i think it's just that we are in the middle of pretty aged outlets right now so like like the tools and mediums people use to create art the platforms we spread information through especially i think the platforms we sped, sp spread information to cater to just having as much massive information as they possibly can flowing through them at all times and they yeah. they reward the participant for spreading more information. So what are people going to do? They're going to take the lowest hanging fruit and easiest way to keep spreading more and more information. And I think that looks a lot like everything is just derivative and shitty and unoriginal when in fact it's probably just that we're getting, mm. we're maturing toward another thing. Like it could be VR, mm -hmm. it could be these more um, immersive ways to explore ideas and create things it could be things that are going to um, shrink the distance between my mind and your mind to the point where whoa our minds are in a hive mind state right now and we're you know cooperating and mm. uh we are like creating a factored version of our consciousness where now suddenly we're twice three times four times more powerful than we were before and i think that i i think we're getting to that and i think it's just i mean because I, I thought for a long time you know it's it's obviously really difficult to see disruptive technologies before they come but if you try to conceive mm. of what is after vr or what is after like mr and ar like mixed reality augmented reality i think the next logical step is how do we shrink the boundary more? How do we connect more? And to me, that's that's it. That's the last frontier is like the mind and the individual get shrunk down even more. And the, the intelligent, intelligence and creation just keeps growing. Well, what about dreaming? I think that's mm, where mm. that's the place to start and lucid dreaming, you know, and clubs of that happening and becoming popular and becoming really like, you know, I think that's where it becomes, that, that's the next level from using um, devices, you know, and that is real, that is happening, you know, and I think it's, it's, you know, what's it going to take for that to, to take hold? I mean, in some ways, the, the electronics, the devices are, are crutches that are also like, what are they actually doing to us? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. I, yeah. Quite, quite synchronistic of you to mention lucid dreaming because I kid you not, today 
I am beginning a lucid dreaming experiment with two of my friends uh-huh. that run a company called Eat Dream B. And they're mm-hmm. fantastic dudes, very much the same ethos as you and I and everybody listening. Um, and, you know, they have this, they have a product that's supposed to uh, increase your natural amount of neurotransmitters for things like serotonin and melatonin how to help you have yeah. more lucid dreams. And um, yeah, we've been talking about starting this for a while now. And I was just on the phone with uh, Hardy from the company earlier today. And we're like, yeah, we're going to start it. Um, he's going to kind of join me in um, in the spirit of fraternity and also do it. So yeah, starting tonight, I'm going to start a two week lucid dreaming experiment where I'm going to have this whole ritual that I do beforehand. And my ultimate goal is, have you ever heard of, have you ever read any of the Carlos Castaneda stuff about lucid dreaming? Mm -hmm. Um, Where he talks about um, like talking to or communicating with the quote unquote dream emissary, which is like this intelligence within the dream. Mm -hmm. Um, So my my goal is I'm going, I want to try to ask at least one question to the dream emissary in the two weeks. So we'll see. We'll see if I can, Each if night. I can accomplish that. Just, I, I'm going to be happy with just one because just, I've... Just one, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've ever personally... I've had very vivid dreams and like moments of lucidity mm. where I kind of... And then I immediately wake up. But for me, I, I think even that seems like a pretty, pretty lofty goal at this point. So do you, um, I, you... You said you have a ritual of different things that you're going to do like in preparation and like what you're going to do every night before you go to sleep and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I know that there's a lot of like little clues. Um, there, that, this is one thing that came up when I was teaching in Vienna um, for the second half of the winter trimester at the cool. Vienna Academy of Visionary Art, um, February, March. There was one of uh, one of the students, uh, Stefan, he, uh, he did a presentation on lucid dreaming. And he's a real avid lucid dreamer. He's 19 or he just turned 20. And he's like this super, like his stories are fascinating, his dreams, and he, he taught us a lot. Hmm. Um, and one of the things that was then a, um, a regular thing for the rest of our um, time together was dream check. And so you'd write, you'd draw a little symbol on your hand, hmm, hmm. and just every, during the day, you would do like dream check, look at your hand, and look at the symbol. And what it does is it trains you yeah. over time to have this kind of like like dream check. And so then that kind of thing you'll do in your dream. You'll remember, oh, you, when you start to think like, the, oh, this could be a dream. And then it triggers dream check. And then you look at your hand or you look at something and then you see that something's different and yes. something's off. Yes. And then that's when you know that you're in a dream. You know, and so it's it's kind of a fun thing. But these are the kinds of things that I think, I mean, why shouldn't uh, th- this should get go viral? You know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think it will. Agree. Yeah, yeah. And and all these all these arenas we're talking about are, are uh, I like to refer to them as like subjectivity technologies because they're they're things that we all have the capacity to unlock within our own reality but they're just not celebrated by the dominant forces in our culture right now. There's, there's mm-hmm. no like economic inherent, at least economic value in doing these things. Therefore, like, it's not like we're, we're not like talking about lucid dreaming with our kids in school. You know, there's, we're not talking about ways to explore your subjective reality in school. And I think that's why people, you know, there's that whole famous Alan Watts, rant about a guy who does everything the way he's supposed to do through his whole life and then he you know goes to a great college gets to a great company becomes a vice president by the time he's like 45 years old and gets his corner office and he sits down at his desk and he's like fuck i've like i've been scammed like i you know like i'm I'm here like i'm supposed to be fulfilled and happy now but i still feel like the same you know angsty lacking void that I felt my whole life, the whole time I've been chasing these false answers. And I think the the real satisfying stuff is buried in there. It's 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 yeah. waiting there for you to start exploring through things like, you know, creation, uh, lucid dreaming, meditation, 
gnosis, psychedelic states, whatever, you know, like exactly. And and as long as we're not giving people those tools, people are going to continue to feel that lacking. Yeah. No, there's a great void, a great void within the cult, the cults of commerce of uh, spirituality or like this void of whatever you're talking about. That is the, the void of creativity. Mm-hmm. How about that? You know, of being a um, a worker bee in a sense of having of the, of the rat race of having to do this for that and this for that and it's this hamster wheel thing that just doesn't end. You know, I go yeah. and do that so that I can pay my rent, so that I can do that, and then you're just like, fuck. You know, people are like, where's the magic? You know, yeah. where's the spark and the inspiration to be alive? What is like actually challenging me and making me feel really good? You know, because I think like stagnation, it doesn't feel good. No. <laughs> and stagnation is what happens when um, purpose is, the, the, the purpose isn't really involved too. And I think higher purpose is something, because I mean the purpose of being like, okay, I want a big house. That's a purpose too. <laughs> you know, where I want to be like financially secure, but it's not higher purpose. Higher purpose is something that that has to do with um, uh, is not commercial, right? So it is a very this is a very interesting conversation, like creativity and and uh, like the commercial like economic um, value within that and how that is um, how creativity is is something that is constantly being stamped down in certain ways because it needs to be commodified. Mm -hmm, Certain mm -hmm. people like say me for an example, you know, like I live from my art, but at the same time, it's not what fuels my art. Right. But at the same time I have to sell my art because I'm not doing something else. I mean, I I'm teaching more and more these days, which is also very satisfying, very expanding on in many ways. Um, I also get some painting done, not as much as I do if I'm really focusing on my painting, of course. And that brings in a financial aspect, you know, mm-hmm. but still it's, it's involved with creativity. It's not directly selling, um, selling, say, paintings. But I'm also, we're also making clothes like this, what I'm wearing yeah, right yeah. now. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. This, is, this is one of our new, from our new collection. Um, and, and that's something that is a... a yeah, it's a it's something to sell. Like we 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 sell these things. They're not just objects. That it, it's you. part of that. I know, but, no, but, but people get mad. That's it's that's ridiculous. I mean, that's ridiculous. What are you supposed to do? I mean, are you supposed to just be destitute and just you but, know like collect but, alms like a like an art monk on the side of the road? Okay, but there we go. This is this is a this is actually a very I think fascinating uh, point to talk about because a lot of the content, the message, the story and the art, a lot of, a lot of things are kind of drawing towards an awakening of the slave culture, right? Mm-hmm. That we are in. Right. So there is a contradiction to then making a statement like that to kind of going out there and get this, this awakening is happening. What happens is when awakening starts to happen, you also like fucking, I've been lied to. Like I blah 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 blah, all this kind of stuff comes up, and then it's like, oh, buy this really awesome psychedelic poncho that we just made, right? You know, right, right. And that's like a, uh, it's been it's like an interesting kind of like theme that weaves through, and is also for me like, I have to be careful in my in my presence, say, of what I put out into the world, that I'm also not always trying to sell things. <laughs> And I'm like, I don't, yeah. if you really talk to me, I'm not going to try to probably sell you anything because that's not the first thing on my mind. But when it's like, okay, we got to pay the bills. I'm like, oops, I didn't post something that was just like from my heart. But I have to remember that constantly, that the, what, what is this really what we're doing is a bigger picture. But we are living in this world of commerce still too. So it's like, how do we create like, these new forms of being and new technologies, new spaces of interaction. How do we promote all of that, but at the same time still pay our rent? But but I would say that that your your success and your ability to live off of your art isn't a result of your you know your business acumen or or your like your desire to extract money from people right i think it's i think it's the opposite i think it's the 
that comes as a result of what you're doing naturally. And I think that's the way that you're supposed to accumulate wealth ethically. You know, you're supposed to accumulate wealth and and things as a result of cultivating relationships with other people where by a natural outgrowth of that they want to support you and they they want to celebrate you and that's the primary way of exchanging energy in our culture is is financially unfortunately like and and that i mean actually when andrew and i uh andrew o'keefe um who works at singularity university now we're talking about how do we make a better future that's like the primary answer if you ask me is creating a paradigm where the human being comes before the dollar, which is not the world we live in right now. And you, you see the direction it's heading and we need to Boy. reconsider that. And I, and I think there are some people in positions of power that realize that. I mean, like there's a, at least the musks of the world seem to have other ideas. Um, they find to be more important than, than profit, but but yeah, I mean, it, it, it is an ongoing, unanswered question, I think, how we how we balance these things, because it's not it's not either or it's not like we're going to get rid of the dollar tomorrow and have some sort of like break off civilization that is just like kumbaya and creating and living off of some sort of, you know, AI that's just delivering food every night or something. I mean, maybe 100 years from now, but we're not there yet. I, you know, I had this insight the other day on um, the transparency hmm. and that I believe that we're going towards more and more transparency oh, yeah. with, yeah. you know, and that that is actually going to be one of the key elements of accountability too, as we see through to ourselves and we see each other, mm -hmm. we also become maybe more accountable, you know, it's like, and in some ways, it's like, oh, man, I don't want people to see into my world. I don't want to see what I them to see what I'm actually spending my money on. You know what I mean? But there's something about that a little bit. There's a there's there's a lot of hidden um, uh, addictions, a lot of hidden oh, yeah. um, things and, and ways that money is flowing that is um is not really something that if it were transparent, would you want people to know, you know? And as yeah. we talk about like opening that, the, the fields of consciousness and the world and everything, like that's kind of where we need to look, you know, like where's the, and how are we even down to how much water you use and where you are in the world, like your, your consciousness with the, with your environment, you know? As a showing of solidarity, let's reverse. Let's let's release our bank records. And <laughs> I'm I'll, sorry, Amanda. I'm gonna I'm gonna call you out. Amanda bought at least ten bags of M and M's this month. I've seen her receipts. She's got some improving to do. <laughs> <laughs> M and M's. It's just a, It's one of those old childhood fixes. Is it? Is it really though? Actually, I I was not allowed to have any kind of sugar for most of my <laughs> that's probably why you turned out to be a great artist because i can promise you that the amount of sugar i ingested probably like retarded the growth of my brain to some point where it just it just crippled me for for the rest of my existence but at least so in weird. art i don't know it's so weird though how like the deprivation of something can then create like like yeah. an addiction to it or the other way around like this the 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 way the way the the personality works and also all the experiences we're all so unique but it's true i mean and the thing is we we all have little ticks we all have like a, a degree of unconscious behavior and that's the way it is you know there's no like if we live in the state of trying to fix it in the future i should be this or i should uh, or in the past we are living outside of of the present duh but it's where yeah. we live a lot of the time, you know, in terms of our perception and our judgment and, 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 which is constantly creating more obstacles for ourselves, you know, yeah. but yeah, but, it, it has, it has like this, that I think that's how like, um, not addictions, but kind of incessant behaviors. Like, um, have you ever, like I used to work with autistic kids and one of the things they would do is this behavior called stimming 
where they would they would kind of incessantly like and it can manifest in so many different ways but it can be like a you know like a thing they're always like doing with their hands and they're you can just tell they're ruminating and their mind is going like a trillion miles an hour and you have to be like come on like come out of that come out of that and you have to constantly try to correct that out of them i feel like that just manifests in more subtle ways with people who are more uh socially normal you know people who can who can operate at a more uh, socially acceptable level. And I think, unfortunately, the ways that we do those things are these weird sort of self-damaging hangups that might be installed into our psyche through exactly what you're talking about, like your parents not giving you something as a kid, and now you just unconsciously go toward it because you couldn't have it, you know? And, and that's like, that's one of those same sorts of self-defeating behaviors. And I think, but again, we're, you know the answer to all of these things is these subjective technologies are, are getting looks behind the curtain of your patterns, yeah. getting, you know, different, um, different vantage points on, on your own behaviors. And that, that is available to everybody. Oh, there's also so many like perspectives on where the roots of those behavioral patterns come from. Right. And yes. I mean, one thing that my mother has been really, really into lately is all this stuff about the truth of vaccines, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and like all the heavy metals that are ingested into little tiny babies, you know, and what the, happens to their immune systems and also different genetical, um, actually patterns and how they react to certain metals and boys or girls and like all this kind of stuff that's coming out. And I'm like, what are you for reals? I mean, to consider that is, and then look at, um, on like say, uh, you know, certain religions, beliefs, s spiritual kind of, uh, directions, like say Scientology mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. things like that, that are, there's entities that are attached to us that are also creating these obstacles and these behavioral patterns. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different avenues of, of, trying to figure out the what's the culprit what is the goo what is the gunk what is the yeah. the thing that is actually affecting us on a different scales some more so to the to the degree where they have to be taken care of they can't function actually in the world right to others that are able to function but still have these things you know and those that, yeah the human the, the human culprit? imagination yeah. is fantastic at manifesting boogeymen right whether it's it's like Who's the boogeyman? Hi hi hidden lizards that are secretly running, you know, the world banks or the governments or, you know, people living inside the hollow earth or the Illuminati or the Freemasons or the Nazis or the communists or the Jews or the whatever, you know, like there's a trillion different answers people have come up to or, or any of the things you just mentioned. And I think, you know, although some of those are real to varying extents, I mean, Maybe lately I've just been on a huge like free will kick, but the the most vicious monster and the the scariest demon is inside your your mind. Is it's inside your subjective reality? And I mean, it was funny. Like I've brought this up a few times, so sorry again, regular listeners. But um, in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, I thought this was just like such an adept piece of information. Um, they talk about how upon the transitioning state, you'll be confronted with um, vi like hundreds of furious gods and kind gods and all of these things that can distract you and hold you back when you get yeah. when you when you start when you get into that. Uh, it, they, I think they call it like the intermediate uh, realm or whatever. And they say, like, basically, don't be distracted by these things because they're projections of your own subconscious and they're mm -hmm. they're there to just hold you into your form hold you into your uh your ego and mm. so, so you can be reincarnated again and you know you you your ego it's like a defense mechanism for your ego basically it's like an ancient way of saying hey watch out for these defense mechanisms of your ego and those things are manifesting in all the ways you just mentioned right now like and people are getting caught up in that shit and that I, I think that's self-defeating i think that's the kind of stuff that again we're just wasting energy on that we shouldn't be yeah to a degree although like the whole thing with vaccinations has got me a bit stumped i do want to i, I want to know more about that because that's a that's a very physical body thing like sure it is yeah 
yeah, what and are I, the I'm effects not... of those things on people, you know, and is that, is, is there truth behind it? And that mm-hmm. really takes you into the whole truth mo- thing, you know, who's telling the truth and who's lying to us. And maybe right. there, it's probably, there's both out there, but how's it happening? Who's it really like, there's, there's all kinds of Things. It's okay. certainly more plausible than flat earth in my mind, at least, because I mean, we're, we're talking about things that yeah. exist, right? Things that exist and exactly. are having a physical effect on your body. And yeah. there are people making these things that have a humongous vested interest in making them in terms of making money. So it would not and be the first. what are the, the first... casualties? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm not For the real. most informed. So I, you know, I can't, I can't speculate. Yeah. Doctors sure seem think to think like... it's safe, but but I think for those that are like, uh, for those that have small children now, like, mm-hmm. the, the, I don't have a small child. I have a small niece and nephew, and I trust my my brothers and their family. You know that they're gonna be they're investigating, you know, and doing what they need to do. But it's like, vaccinations are also different now than they were thirty years ago. You know, what's the world? What what is the? And there's a lot of people that are really for them and think that they're super super necessary. And if we don't do them that we're endangering each other in great ways, you know, like. Why can't we make organic vaccines? Why can't we make, you know, it seems like we should be able to make like organic. I'm probably sounding like the stupidest person in the world right now to anyone that knows anything about chemistry. But, but in my mind, it's like, why, why, why do we have to have heavy metals in, in vaccines? Yeah. What, uh, I what, think that's what a legitimate that question. I'm very interested in, in, in hearing some answers to that question. So maybe we'll put that out there to the listeners. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Educate yeah. us. <laughs> yeah, please do, because I am Educate woefully uneducated um, in terms of what's really biologically going on there. But I, I want to take it back a, a few steps. And I guess we're getting past an hour already. But um, yeah, I know. You, you mentioned, um, you know, people needing that sort of when, back when we were talking about this whole uh, Alan Watts thought experiment. And in, in kind of realizing that you're being led down this path that's ultimately going to be existentially unsatisfying. Did, mm-hmm. Was there a moment in your life that you can point to or a certain catalyst where that reality was unlocked for you, where you decided, I don't want to go this traditional route. I want to go the inward creation based route. Was there a catalyst or was that something where you just you kind of always inherently knew? I kind of always inherently knew, and I was very blessed to have um, paths opened to me and uh, supportive uh, adults and and projects that kind of like supported that Mm -hmm. exploration. So, I mean, I actually never, um, I never went and studied something that I decided I didn't want to study anymore. I -hmm. never got into a job that I really didn't want to do that I didn't see was uh, beneficial to a bigger picture for me of of feeding like my my data bank of of things that I can do like that that weave in also to the bigger picture of of sharing I, I I'm curious about a lot of things too it's like uh but the, I, I think I've never stopped making art and art was something that I started making money from when I was 14. Wow. And so that was just, and it was just because like, oh, hey, I could do this. That person, like I painted on some t-shirts for Christmas and um, somebody saw them and was like, hey, I really like that. Could I buy one from you? And I was like, oh, (laughs) I could do that. And I I think I was babysitting at the time. And that was kind of one of those things, well, I could sell some t-shirts and then I wouldn't have to babysit as much. Yeah. So it was like, a, you know, it was like a utilitarian. It was definitely catalyst. utilitarian. Yeah. Totally. And then doing portraits too. Like, Oh, I could do something fun and make money. That sounds cool. I think I could do that. That sounds like a fun adventure. And I could go there and do this and do that. And it's kind of like very naive in a sense, but also like, Oh, I could do that and get that. That sounds like a good thing. Yeah, but you that's know, like so, that's like a, a pure like blissful naivety yeah. because you're not you're not cluttering up your path with the expectations of other people and the the doubt that it seems like so many people have. I mean, 
maybe there's people out there that aren't super talented that should have some doubt, but there's a lot of people who are really talented that have so much doubt. And like, are, mm-hmm. like I personally have talked to other successful artists that still tell me that they're constantly judging their own work and just thinking it's shit and not wanting to put it out. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with um, Beeple. He's been doing every days for like, I think he's getting close to like 10 years of every days now. And he's amassed a huge following over that course of time. But he said the reason he started doing like putting out a piece of art every day is because he was falling into this like self-judging trap of never wanting to put his work out. So he was just mm-hmm. like, all right, I'm just going to set this precedent every single day. I'm going to put something out. As, What's his name? Uh, he goes by the name Beeple. So it's like beep Ellie. Um, and he does a lot of um, like d- like digital based art and um, like motion graphics. And the other thing that's really cool is he puts all this stuff out on Creative Commons. So it's just like, here, everybody take this, do whatever you want with it. I don't care. Um, but he's 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 become quite successful over over that whole course of time from somebody who was just doubting himself mm. and thinking he sucked to, you know, working with like huge artists and it's a crazy story. Well, the thing is, is like you're, I, I, like full satisfaction isn't really something that uh, it's rare in a way. Like mm-hmm. it's something like the the driving force of being unsatisfied is actually really important to like look at a pain and be like, yeah, I mean, that's not right. I was like, I don't want to do this. I want to do that. And it's like this thing is like, what? When is the painting finished? When is a piece of work? What is the, you know, some would say that's finished. You know, then another, it's very subjective, right? Completely. But yeah. it's like, there's a, there's, there's a driving force of unsatisfaction that keeps you going, you know, and that's unique. Every single person is unique. So I think though, ga- being able to, as a creator, to step back and to see your work as its own, uh, as, as its own entity is something that's very important to do and to you know, not be so judgmental and such a person, take things so personally in, a, in that relationship as, as the artist, you know, but there, there, I think there are general vibrational laws or something that, that make also a piece of work extremely successful, you know, and that's, that's a whole interesting kind of subject to look at, you know, what makes a piece of work successful what makes it look what makes it finished Mm -hmm. what what Mm -hmm. when is something unfinished i mean it's very we don't have that criteria now people post anything and everything a lot of times i'll post like a sketch of something and then the finished piece you know and you and people are like oh i liked it better before (laughs) i prefer the sketch right i mean it's like you put up a show i did an exhibition in my early 20s that had 80 pieces in it (laughs) i didn't know any better I had a huge, I had this opportunity to do this show in this big insurance company's like um, five floors. This it was one of the, it was a really fa- fabulous um, show and sold actually quite a bit and over five hundred people came to the opening. Wow. I was like twenty four. That's amazing. And and this um and I really got to see also how diverse the taste was of people. There wasn't it, it wasn't like one painting got all the attention. Like there was people that liked that and then the others liked that. And then that person said, that's my favorite painting. And then the other one said, that's my favorite painting. And I was like, (laughs) you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's really interesting because I've always thought of, you know, like the higher brain frontal lobe as like an obstacle to creativity. And I think a lot of people think of it that way, like, because that is the part of the brain that judges and thinks about the result of things and planning and all of this stuff. And clearly, yes, that that is an obstacle. But without it, creativity for the sake of creativity is going to suck. Like there's there's like, you know, if there's no if there's no master up there pulling the strings and saying, now do this, now do that. That's not enough. Do more of that over there and whatever. You're you're just going to have a bunch of nonsense, right? You're just going to have like 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 shit stew coming out of your mouth or your hand just ah creation is great you know and that's not good either so it, it's it is a balance exactly what you're saying it's like for me this medium there there's no there there's no time where 
I could just keep editing and I could keep editing and keep editing and I could eliminate every single gap in like in between every single moment if I wanted to. But, you know, that's so it is. It's I think it's the same for for every medium. It's it's just about developing that flow. But that that is an interesting question because it makes me want to redact what I said earlier about creativity as a a, you know, just an inherent quality in reality to Mm. it's actually a dimension of consciousness it's like a it's a dimension of consciousness that happens when consciousness consciousness gets to a certain level because i don't think you can have it in a way that would make any sort of sense to us or any other sentient being unless it Mm. was wrapped up in all the stuff that we like you know if Mm. without without language without culture without all these things it would be meaningless to us. So we need to have those like higher brained parts to make or appreciate anything worthwhile. So I think, I don't know, it's, that's kind of an interesting. Well, that's where skill and like, you know, you look at, um, I think music is always a good example, Mm -hmm. you know? And so somebody that is really one with their instrument, you know, and then they play an amazing work, amazing composition. I mean, all of that comes together into greatness, <laughs> you yeah, know, exactly. hands down. Yeah. You're like, my whole body wants to hear that, that music and nothing is out of uh, resonance. And that is because the vessel that it's coming through, the human, the instrument, everything is in tune. And that in tuneness takes practice and discipline, you know. So I think it is the refinement of, of the, you know, the skill, the instrument, the the eye, the the muscles, everything involved, and then to invite that that divination <laughs> to, yeah. Yeah. to come through, and then it's like, okay, perfect moment, inspirational moment. Let's hope it was recorded, you know, or you know, and that's. And I love that we wound up at the point again where it's you know something that comes through you because this is something I used to ask artists like, do you feel like it's something that comes through you? And I've just stopped because every single one of them says yes. Every single one where they say it feels like you get to a certain point where it's just coming through you and you're just channeling it, and and you then you you're doing it and it's you look at it and you're like, oh, I did that, okay, and it's effortless. It's, that's amazing. Do, so and do you have do you have any like rituals or things that you do to get into that state of mind or do you just start and it I definitely to have to I definitely have to set set myself up um but it is a decision. It's like okay, here we go. And it is a decision and there are things that I do get kind of picky about and it is um uh I get very sensitive on on um, I've noticed more and more and um, there's things that I, I feel like I turn more into a diva than I ever <laughs> do um, before I'm really going to, cause I, I open myself up to that, to that flow. And especially also in performance settings, like live painting, I used to just set up somewhere and be like, all right, let's just paint. And I can do that still, but there's, I, I care too much. I think I've gotten to a point of caring more and more and seeing what is possible. And I want to see that, continue to push the boundaries of anything that I've ever experienced. Mm. And I know that that like in a setting, especially live painting with, with live music in a setting where people can see what I'm doing, where the energy is really like involved. And then I can be there. I have my tools, my brushes, my, you know, I have everything that I need and then to call it in and to go into it with, with like a, a really set, a nice set of live music or DJ or whoever it is that's also really in communication to a degree with me, like really respects that I am there too and I them. You find that like right medium of all of those things, mm-hmm. then it's like I, I it's the most exciting, the most profoundly like exhilarating and highest potential I think for everything. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. but it's like and I, I've had to go through a lot of experiences of things that aren't like that, you know, having beer spilled on me, somebody yeah. coming up, taking oh, a brush and like, you know, trying to paint on the piece where you just feel like, like, what are you doing? Why are you doing it there for these people that don't care at all? You know, don't see the potential of the magic, you know, but it's the same in my own studio. So what do I prepare? Do, dancing is incredibly mm. important. Um, moving yoga, 
hydration. Mm. Um, it depends. Sometimes I do like to have a little smoke, you know, and the little, you know, you know, just change the perspective a little bit. Get it's like opening up, you know, the flush out the gunk a little bit of the day of the other things and then get into that, you know, and sometimes it's a morning thing. I would want to paint in the morning. A lot of times I paint at night too, but if I paint in color, I really want to paint with daylight. That's something that I work sense, a lot yeah. with value. I work with concepts. I work with a lot of things at, at night like that. But when it comes to color, it's something that is a daytime thing. Has there been any? So there's, oh, go ahead. No, there's parameters that I've kind of gotten into a system with of how I like uh, their their kind of ways that I do things, uh, but it's not a way, uh, um, but it doesn't matter what it actually then is, but it gives it a certain kind of construct that it anything can flow through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's beautiful. Um, do you, um, do you want to wrap it up? I know I said like an hour or so. I don't want to like keep you forever here. Yeah, you know, actually, on that note, I guess, okay, one more thing I do want to ask you about. I, so, I, like, we got to talk about one more thing. So Come on. On your website, you have this, like, mission statement of, you know, wanting to obliterate the mm -hmm. illusion of people's separateness uh, through through your work. Um, what what exactly does does that mean? And what 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 then, if if separation is an illusion, what is the the real state of things? in your mind. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you, yeah, you text me that little, um, thought blurb there, um, last night and I thought about it because it is something that I'm feeling, I, I want to expand on, you know, I think I need to update that a little bit because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the, one of the truths is, is that we do experience separation. I am not you and you are not me and I am not this, I'm holding this pen. You know, there is like, and there is like a great beauty in that, but at the same time, you know, because there is, I, 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 I can, ex I'm experiencing a subjective reality. Um, but at the same time, there is this connectedness that is, um, um, hard to see sometimes because we feel so, mm -hmm. you know, trapped within this being. So, and then you, duality, right? So we, it seems that we live in a, in a state of duality. Um, I think all of this is true. <laughs> and I think that we are connected. So the thing is, is it's not, a, it, it's not that to, um, to break down this illusion of separation. It's more to see, um, see deeper into the ways we are connected. And I think that the the paintings, like I am constantly within the act of of creating, seeing how one thing leads into the next, into the next, into the next, and it is this like constant dance of 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 contrasts of things and and and, and um, harmonics, right? Hmm. There are harmonic like um, patterns, shapes. That, that work in a way that create certain feelings and, and images, right? Okay, I, I know exactly what you're saying. I know exactly what you're saying. But expand on that. Expand what you mean by that. Because I, I feel like I physically actually have seen what you're talking about at times. Maybe not in like everyday waking consciousness states, but mm -hmm. in, in, in certain states of of expanded consciousness i've 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 physically seen exactly what you're talking about but but can you expand on that <laughs> what do you mean expand on like, expand like... on what you mean by harmonics and like the things yeah. that are giving rise to are, are, i it sounded like you're going toward these harmonics and these shapes and these vibrations are literally giving rise to what we are as individuals is is that where you're going or am i am i going well, off in a different direction no yeah what is the root and the essence of existence and the feeling of and connecting to that i think we all want to know what we are mm -hmm. and and what is happening also in this kind of like fear of what is coming you know 
uh, it's all this kind of like coming into a deeper understanding of the power that is existing right now. Mm-hmm. So coming, so the more we can understand and and the more we can understand what's going on and the um, the energetics, the physics. I mean, it's so much, but I think like the pr- provoking nature of art can help satisfy these kind of desires to understand what's going on and can also lead us into um, um, channels of focus. And if we focus on something, we think about something, we, it starts to become something that becomes a habit, becomes a part of us, right? You see an image once and it's imprinted on you forever. It's the same with, with, with music. It's the same with sound. It's in, we are like adding to our libraries. I believe that. I believe that that's happening. You know, we are molding and merging. It's like when you eat a lot of something that <laughs> it starts to change an aspect of you, right? Right, right. And then that is the, the effect of that. So the illusion of separation, like we are not separate. It's true. There is, there is no separation. But at the same time, we are like, we are uniquely uh, um, u- unique. <laughs> we are yes, uniquely yeah. individual. Uh, in, in a, uh, it, it's and it's miraculous it's absolutely miraculous that there is this infinite capacity for individuation within reality like within you know atoms which in and of themselves are no different from your atoms or my atoms or the atoms in that pen but somehow within the alchemy of these billions of atoms you get Amanda and you get Michael and you get all of this other shit and reality doesn't collapse in on itself. It's just, you know, it's, it's incredible and it's extremely miraculous. And, and I think the, the kind of conversation, the mainstream conversation around that miracle is actually kind of insulting to the ridiculousness of existence. And when I say ridiculousness, I mean, incredible, you know, majesty and magic mm. that is existing at all, you know? And, yeah. and it's, it's, it's a random accident. It's a random accident and your genetics determined everything and that's it. You know, or you have all the religious or you have all the right religious stories right. that are so sure. like just wrought, yeah. wrought with, with wanting to control people and wanting to, Uh, keep certain people in power and demean women or whatever the case is. But so exactly what I'm talking about every, for some reason, everybody loves Bill Nye, but I I find him to be like such a smug, self-important dick. Like I saw this, I saw this um, clip of him where somebody asked him if the universe uh, cares about people or if the universe is conscious (coughs) or something and and he mm-hmm. took on this so just oh does the universe care about you no the universe doesn't care about anything the universe isn't conscious there there's no like it's it's just you know like and then he got on this whole like talking over people's heads sort of uh riff where he's just talking about how everything's just an accident of physics and it's just like yeah ah. but the provoking nature of that for an example is something that yeah, that plays a role. Oh, for sure, for sure. I mean, in, in that course. kind of commentary, you know, because it get makes you then, well, no, I, I don't believe that. I believe this, you know. And we're constantly bouncing all of these things. I, I mean, I agree with you. I agree. Right. And, I agree that it's not just an accident, but it sometimes seems like it has to be because it's too intelligent. How could it be this intelligent? You know, when things happen, you're like, oh my god, I dreamt that yesterday and then all of a sudden that just happened Mm -hmm. and there's so many things like that that go into the field of the unexplained the paranormal you know i mean that whole that whole direction is actually i think the most exciting i mean that's what a lot of my paintings are about Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. what i want to talk about and what i think more people should be talking about you know like and i think a lot of people want to it does it does the the it's it's a it's a really massively growing community um but it isn't focused in one direction there but people all over the world want to know and i think that where religions aren't as much of a like 
uh, where one looks to necessarily. I mean, a mass amount of people still do. Sure. Yeah. The majority, I guess. But more and more people are like, um, I don't know, you know, and are not going to get their head chopped off for looking another direction, you know. Mm-hmm. I think there needs to become, yeah, there is, and there is. There's so much out there that one can like learn and research and read and publish and stuff. It's yeah. awesome. And it's so, and I and think it's so I, tricky. It's so tricky too so because just, like – I see like I see these, you know, certain videos or certain pieces of information that just feel like inauthentic and like a an attempt at getting people to sign up for something or click on something. No, the clickbait thing, yeah. you know, and it taints it so much. Like come on, like don't play with my my want to know, my desire to to be, you know, it, it right. is really tricky, but I, I too, I, I really think this is a very, very important um, subject. I do too. <laughs> you know? I, I do too. And and again, like this, is like what we talked about in the beginning, where when you start to prey on those desires that people have to know things or or to have the answers that they don't have the question or that to have the questions answered that they don't have answers for, and then you start, you know, we're like, well go to this website. There's a lot of great videos about aliens on there that might answer some of your questions, but it's, it's more likely just programming, you know, it's pr- like programming yeah. in the television sense of sign up for this for $5 a month or whatever. And there's, you know, I don't know. It's, it's such a, it's so tricky and it, it gets, it gets down to make connections with quality people, make connections with quality people, whether they're people in the art community or people mm. who are really searching for answers or whatever, you know, don't, don't rely on some big monetized channel for answers. Cause that's no better than a church. Like a church is probably a, just a, an older version of that exact same thing with a huge agenda behind it. You know, it's, it's about quality connections and having primary experiences. And, you know, it's like the, those subjective technologies that we were talking about. Well, your own personal experiences, mm-hmm. but how many people would love to see a UFO and have not? How I, many people would, would love, love to. to have experience, you know, a full blown miracle and have not, you mm-hmm. know, and there are those that then have, and they go out and they say, well, I have seen this and I have seen that. And then others listen to them. And how much of that story is true? Do we know, mm-hmm. you know, and, and <laughs> the way channeling you know, these, these angels and spirits and, collectives are speaking through people you know it's very very fascinating but do we know you know do you know about edgar edgar casey's yeah, work yeah. all of that you know that's mm-hmm. been that's fascinated my whole life me my whole life you know and yeah for people who don't know he was the most he was the most prolific clairvoyant quote unquote of the 20th century like he could go so it is interesting though like his technique is he would go into that hypnogogic state between waking and sleeping and when he was in that state it was like you could ask him a question and an answer would just pop out whether or not that was just a you know a something that flew like flowed out Mm -hmm. of his subconscious or he really was tapping into you know i believe he called it the noosphere people later on started calling it the noosphere the akashic records or whatever the akashic records he did call it that yeah Yeah, like you know this uh, it's, I think the no sphere is sort of a similar idea, like this sort of mm. o- overmind that's a result of the of individual minds or like a mm. some sort of, sort of like repository or something. But yeah, whether who knows? I mean, and that's again that that gets into the the paradox behind all of this stuff is you know is it is it inside or outside? So or exoteric? You know? Do you ever uh, listen to Coast to Coast AM? I have. I, I'm not like a regular listener, but I, I have. I'm familiar with it. Yeah, I'm not a regular listener um, at the moment. I mean, I've go, I go through phases, and I, I've been a subscriber for many years because I like to go into the archives and um, be able to listen to whatever I want whenever I want. Mm-hmm. But it, it, what I really enjoy also about um, Coast to Coast is the fact that there are, what, two million listeners every night or more like most listen to late night radio show in the world wow 
And I think that's a fascinating fact For because sure. um, it, sh- I mean, just the numbers show, you know, the truth of it. Like people are very interested in this, in these subjects, you know, Yeah. Um, across the board. A lot of them are truck drivers, security people, people working night shifts of things, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, all think- over the world and mostly America, though. I think if I traveled more, I would definitely listen to that because I can just see being yeah. like on the road late at night and be like, "Ooh, coast to coast is on," and just being coast like, just getting into those like ghost stories and you know, freaking myself out, making the time pass, but also having some thought provoking musings. May- okay, maybe this would be a, a funny place to re- fun and funny, and possibly I don't want to say funny because that's not this is going to be really insulting. Um, what what's the craziest? I was you brought up UFOs before, so I was going to ask if you've seen a UFO, but I'll just change it to if you're open to sharing, what is the craziest experience you've ever had personally? Ever had? Oh, God. Or or any that just stick out? Well, I mean, I have seen some UFOs and those I would consider to be some of the craziest experiences. Um, I remember also creating a ball of light with some friends. When I was a teenager, that was something that uh, was like, did I just experience that? And I think, and I, we all had experienced it. And I like passed out kind of like, then it was so much. I mean, that that's one, I guess, uh, seeing actual UFOs, though, the first time I saw like these things where I was just like, dude, what is going on there? That is not, I've never seen anything move like that. Um blew my mind I think it was the first thing that really opened up like a channel too I was 13 on a vision quest Hmm. with a youth group in Utah and the and I I think it was Utah in the Canyonlands and um was on a solo kind of like night where you're out by yourself in the desert I was 13 years old it was a right rites of passage um journey and this is the first time I saw these lights. You must have were, awesome parents to let you do that. <laughs> I, I do have very interesting parents. My mother's name is Yu. Oh, awesome. Y-O-U, that's her full and legal name. And my father's name is Jackson. And my, my father's a, he's, he's a hand-balancing, acrobatic, really? fireman, cool. musician, and pilot. Wow, all that's around, awesome. Kind of like, and, and explorer of... of uh, visionary states from also, you know, the 60s. And, I, and my parents are just very open. My mother's very interested in a lot of different channels of information. And um, she gets kind of down some crazy rabbit holes more than probably anybody I know. And that's what I've grown up with is being like kind of um, uh, inundated with really, really out there information. You know, but this, so I mean, that's, that's, that created a lot of the foundation of where I come yeah. from. You know? but, what, um, whatever their alchemy is, it worked out because it, it, it produced an Amanda Sage who has now blasted the world with so many awesome pieces of art and ideas and, and, and energy spray. So, so thank you so much for, for being here. In in all senses, whether we're talking about third eye drops or or uh, the three dimensional plane of reality that we currently exist within. <laughs> and my birthday was just last week oh. on Bicycle Day. Oh really? Oh my God! You're yeah okay, <laughs> yeah you're you like manifested in in the perfect condition. Then that's insane. AmandaSage dot com is the digital destination you require for all things Amanda Sage. Of course, you can find her on Facebook and everywhere else as well. As I mentioned, such a tremendous blast hanging out with her. So positive and playful and genuinely kind and fun to talk to. After unleashing the phrase curiosity appetizer, upon the digisphere, which if you'll recall, I did during the introduction to this podcast. I'm sure you recall because it was wildly profound. Anyway, after I said that, I started to think about specific common appetizers that people eat that I could possibly use as an even more effective phrase. But then I just immediately thought of Wonder Mozzarella Stick and 
wonder chicken strip, which just just wasn't doing it for me. Also, apparently, I just jumped to the most uh, terrible foods on the planet that are like elementary school cafeteria level or ski lodge level or maybe wonder pizza roll a wonder pizza roll that would be wonder taco now we're getting dangerously close to entree i don't know taco could be appetizer or entree you're in overtime people anything goes at this point the show is for all intents and purposes over uh if you want to support third eye drops as i mentioned head to patreon.com forward slash third eye drops of course you can crowdfund the show there or you can head to third eye drops.com and check out the rest of our mind melds and do the same and if you have a few moments we would deeply appreciate if you would look us up on itunes and give us a nice review and subscribe but most of all thank you so much for listening and tuning your consciousness into our musings we bow to you my friends and dearly dearly hope that you have an excellent inspiring and ontologically stimulating week until next time